Hello, and welcome to Meet the Candidates, a show where we give residents an opportunity to learn a little bit more about candidates who hope to one day represent them. I'm your host, Candace Mashat. And with me right now is Steve Barber, who is running for Ninth Ward City Council seat. Good e evening, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, well, this is technically our first time meeting, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm a 33-year-old uh, Ninth Ward resident. I, I was uh, raised here in the Ninth Ward, um, grew up and, and went to school um, at, at Cody Elementary, which we um, know is no longer um, uh, as as well as graduating from the International Academy of Flint, which is also uh, in the Ninth Ward. Um, I currently work in the Ninth Ward uh, at International Academy of Flint. Um, during the day, I'm a PE teacher, and then in the afternoon, I work with uh, Youth Quest, um, engaging with our, our youth. And so, um, heavily involved in the community, um, have have often uh, been involved with uh, some of the activities that you see around uh, downtown um, and and I kind of was a part of several uh, groups that that kind of jump started those uh, events and and that are still continuing to today and so um, again just very involved with the the community and and uh, want want a better uh, future for for the ninth board and and so, um, that's why I chose to run uh, in, in this uh, election. All right. Well, you answered a little bit more of my, uh, my second question, which was going to be what made you decide to run for office? Is there a little any, anything else that you'd like to elaborate as far as that question is concerned? Yeah, absolutely. I, I thank you. Um, it, it, uh, growing up in the Ninth Ward, um, I, I've kind of seen it uh, decline heavily um, in, in the uh, past decade or so. And uh, in the last um, four years or so, I, I haven't seen much growth. And, and this is an opportunity to um, kind of steer that growth in, in the trajectory that I think the, the Ninth Ward citizens um, want it to go um, with, you know, blight and economic development um, and, and uh, just having, having a better community um, that we can, you know, raise families in and, and uh, just be a, a community that's not always um, in the news for, for something negative. And so that actually leads me right into my next question. Now, you know, recently our community was awarded $97 million. We have um, a, a chunk of that money already here uh, in the city of Flint. And you talked about economic development and black. How would you prioritize the ninety-seven million? Yeah, so so the the ninety-seven million dollars is certainly not going to um, fix all of Flint's problems um, or, or issues, however you want to uh, coin it. But um, I think you know, uh, crime enforcement is is really um, a, a priority that we need to focus on, considering it's one of our uh, greatest hindrances to our communities. Um, also that, you know, crime enforcement equals revenue. Um, there's a lot of you know, traffic violations that are um, consistently going unchecked in the city. And so I think, um, you know, gaining some revenue from that and holding people accountable um, will, will be twofold. There would be some revenue generation as well as, um, you know, safer streets. Um, I like to include blight in with crime because it is a crime for, for you to, to commit um, blight and so um you know blight elimination is is definitely a uh focal point um that i would have uh, it equals you know cleaner and safer communities um and and, and so i think our, our uh, kids deserve that and, and you know ultimately our taxpayers uh deserve deserve a, a cleaner and safer community um that they pay taxes in um i think our uh, city employees that worked in person uh, are deserving of, of premium pay. I think that's very important to take care of your, your employees. Um, I think uh, uh, water infrastructure has been a focal point from, from the resident residents uh, in, in the ninth ward, uh, you know, continuing and, and 
and really, um, you know, completing that that restoration um, from from the crisis. And then I, uh, I I've I've heard a lot about you know citywide uh, Wi-Fi access. I think uh, you know hearing from the residents, you know, it's it's really going to uh, help you know kind of reduce some of those barriers to entry um, to you know the job market and and um, you know access to uh, everything that is on the World Wide Web. Um, for our community. And then uh, revenue replacement is also another category that uh, the ARPA funds uh, have have deemed um, a category. And so I, I think, you know, the, the city would be wise to try to replace any revenue loss that we may have experienced through this uh, pandemic. Now, you are a write-in candidate and you're running against an incumbent. What What sets you apart from the person that you're running against? Yeah, so um, a write-in is is a legitimate uh, candidate. Um, they they just uh, either didn't receive all the signatures uh, required for the primary, uh, or uh, decided later in the game that they they wanted to run. Um, there's there's a number of reasons why people can be a write-in, but uh, I think. Um, one of my my main motivations for uh, running is that this in, this this term this upcoming term is is incredibly important, uh, given that it's going to be five years. Um, there's a lot of money coming into the city, and um, you know I, it's it's not that I necessarily disagree with some of the um, incumbents' votes. It's it's I think I disagree with the um, attitude and and the response uh, to the citizens and, and I think they deserve better and so um, I'm very confident in myself uh, that I, I can uh, provide a better representation um, somebody that is more accessible um, and and more responsive to the uh, constituents of the ninth ward Okay, and we know that um, and working on council, one of the things that you will have to do is to work with the current administration. Now, um, it's no secret that the, the current administration and the council, the relationship could be a bit better, right, according to residents. And so I, I'm just wondering, what's your take on the relationship between the current council and the current administration? Do you think that it needs to be changed? And if so, what are you committed to do? committed to doing to being a part of that change? Yeah, so, you know, I think there's a lot of personal issues that are involved with the, the relationship between uh, the council as a whole and, and the administration um, that, that kind of provides a, a toxic environment um, from, from what I've seen. And so um, I, I understand both sides, I guess. Um, and at the end of the day, um, none of it is really relevant because at the end of the day it's it's about the the citizens and um each each council person uh represents you know a a, a body um a region of the city and and they were responsible for being the voice of those constituents and so um you know whoever sits on council uh whether it's an incumbent or a, a newcomer um, and, and I'm elected. Um, it's it's about working together to get the greater goal uh, accomplished. And um, personally, I, I I don't see any issues with you know hearing people out, getting all questions you know vetted, and and making sure that you know when when somebody goes to vote, they they're not doubting you know why um, they they're voting one way or another. And and so. Um, it's it's not team anybody but but the citizens and and so I, I really think um, that this election is is the opportunity for for a reset between you know whoever whoever is going to win uh, next Tuesday Wednesday and um, and and the administration uh, they will have to work f uh, together for a minimum of one year um it, it, and possibly longer and so um this isn't about you know picking anybody's sides it's, it's about doing right for the citizens of of the ninth ward and the city of wood 
Right. And so we know usually when it is not a presidential year, uh, voter turnout tends to be kind of low. So what are you doing to ensure that uh, voter turnout in the ninth ward is uh, at, at least historically higher than it's been? Yeah, so um, about 10 percent turned out um, the, the last um, race. And so <clears throat> I, I really hope uh, that 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 is uh, better. I think that um, community engagement, uh, a, a lot of people have had time uh, throughout this pandemic to to see um, that that not much is being accomplished. And, and I think it, it's given them an opportunity to uh, seek out, um, you know, who and, and, and why uh, people are running in their community. And I've had a lot of conversations with constituents in the Ninth Ward um wanting a better uh, future for flint and, and um <clears throat> really just looking for for a fresh um perspective and and somebody that can that that is eager and willing uh to do the work that's required to um make this community better and 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 give it a, a trajectory in in the positive direction so one of the things that we like to do here at Meet the Candidates is we make sure that we allow the residents to see uh, the, their, the, the candidates from several different sides, right? We More than just your serious side. So as you're going out and you're knocking doors and you have to assemble a team based off of the last television show that you watched, and they're going to go out and they're going to knock doors with you. Who's knocking doors with Steve Barber in the Ninth Ward? Curb Your Enthusiasm was the last uh, show that, that I watched. Um, so, um, so Larry's going to come knock some doors. You got to, yeah, yeah. Hopefully Larry David's out knocking doors and, and um, you know, uh, hopefully, hopefully he knows what's going on in the moment and, and you know, he can gain, gain uh, the folks' support. Right. And so then after you and your team are done knocking doors, you have to take them somewhere that is just so Flint, right, to eat somewhere that is just like, if you are a Flint resident and you know to go there, you know to eat there, whether it's Ninth Ward or beyond, if you have a spot where you cool, if you have maybe a spot in Ninth Ward and somewhere else you can name, where are you taking uh, the the um, the cast of Curb Your Enthusiasm? Where are you taking them to eat after you're done knocking doors? Wow, um, that's that's tough and that's definitely putting me on the spot. Um, in in the ninth ward, well, first of all, it really depends on the day. Uh, okay. you know, some things are open some days that you know think other things are are not. And so, um, <clears throat> if I were to to really just um, stick to the ninth ward, uh, we're lucky enough to have two big Jones, so I think they would <laughs> they would win. Um, I can I can get them on either side of of the ninth ward. Oh, there you go. What are you recommending that they get from Big John? Oh, you got to go with a um, super steak and and cheese. Okay. Super steak and uh, onion with with cheese. Yeah. Okay. 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 And and so you mentioned that you work um, in in the school system. So you work with children, and uh, you you're you're preparing the next generation for uh, you know what's what's to come. And so my question is, as we look at uh, the water crisis and what's going on and we're thinking about we're bringing up our children and some of the children were affected by it. One of the questions that we're often asked is, um, is the water crisis over? So if, I, if I'm one of your children, I'm saying to you, Mr. Barber, are, are we out of the woods with that yet? Is the water crisis over? What would your response be? Uh, my response would be mostly, but no. Um, I, I don't think we're out of the woods. Uh, our, our people still need to be uh, made whole, as whole as they're going to be made uh, by the uh, justice system. Um, we need to make sure that um, all lead pipes, I, I don't care if there is, um, if it's a vacant, pull it out, you know, make the new people put in a, a the, the new uh, pipe if, if that's needed, but pull them all out. Don't leave any any room for um, for error. And um, 
you know, in, in the trust, I think is, is probably going to be, um, lifelong for some of these people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I teach kindergarten through fifth grade and <clears throat> those, those students of, of mine and, and of that age, they are, are probably the most affected, um, by, by this crisis. And so, um, there's, there's plethora of, of, you know, medical and, and psychological, um, issues that, that come with it. And so, no, we're, we're certainly not out of the woods. Um, like I said, there's, there's lifelong effects that are associated with this. And, and so, um, no, no. Uh, in terms of, of the water replacement, I would I would say mostly, but in terms of the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. no. We've we've got a, a lifetime. Fair enough. And um, just one more question along the water settlement lines. We know that we're still waiting for the judge to, um, you know, decide whether or not the, the settlement is even going to go through. And so uh, my, my question for you is, um, uh, because we all know that uh, every resident does deserve some form of compensation, but is there a particular way that you would divide that compensation? Well, unfortunately, um, the reality is, is I can, I can wish for, you know, anything. And um, there's, there's a stark reality that uh, we face, um, you know, the legal process and the time and effort that went into the litigation, um, you know, was not done for free. And so, um, I, unfortunately, a lot of that money is going to go to lawyers. Um, and if I, I think if, if you know uh, any lawyer was um, had good conscience, they they would take what uh, you know just whatever the you know salary would be for the year or whatever you know whatever true value of that time would be, um, and and donate the rest to the citizens because at the end of the day, that's who's suffering. Um, my my kindergarten through fifth grade, and and you know even up to you know. 12th graders and adults. I mean, we all um, that were here during that time suffered a, a great deal of, of essentially chemical warfare um, in, in, to, in a light degree. And, and so um, it's, it's, it's really sad to, to think about the whole situation and, and the fact that there's going to be lifetime, you know, effects and, and that even if you know everybody got a billion dollars, what is what is that going to do to those kindergarten through through fifth graders that were were exposed the most? Other than provide you know top notch health care, at the end of the day, they're still affected, um, and and so no money, no no amount of money is going to make everybody whole, and and so that's the unfortunate part. Um, I think, uh, whatever the settlement, uh, is, I, I, I don't think it's enough. Um, it, it, it's really hard to put a price tag Mm -hmm. on, on the situation. Well, Mr. Barber, it has been my absolute pleasure to meet you and I have this opportunity to talk with you. Um, and before we get out of here, though, I do want to make sure that I give you an opportunity to look into that camera and let the residents know uh, why they should vote for you, how they can contact you and make sure they have the correct spelling of your name. Yeah, thank you again for having me. It's, it's been an honor to, to share um, some, some answers with you. Um, you know, at, at the end of the, the day, um, I think my community involvement shows a lot. Um, I'm very involved with South Flint and, and um, at the end of the day, uh, I really think that, uh, and have heard um, 
again, one of the reasons why I'm running is because uh, many citizens of the ninth board want a better uh, future for Flint. And, and I think, um, I, and I don't think I'm, I'm fully confident in, in uh, being able to do that. Um, I, I don't uh, just have um, a track record in the public, but, uh, you know, not just a doer. I, I'm also a community builder as well. Um, I can be reached um, through my cell phone, text or call 810-569-6328. I'm on Facebook as well as um, email uh, Steve Barber, ninth ward. That's the number nine, th ward at gmail.com. Um, again, I'm a write in. So um, instead of checking the box with the incumbent, you would check the box below and write my name in. It's Steve with a V, S T E V E, and Barber Lake Barbershop, B A R B E R. And um, with your vote um, and, and trust, I uh, will. Uh, be moving uh, the ninth ward and, and the city of Flint in a, in a more positive uh, direction and, and get some business done uh, that will trickle down to the residents. All right. Well, thank you again. And once again, with us uh, right now is ninth ward council candidate Steve Barber. That's right. Ninth ward council candidate Steve Barber. So thank you for joining us. Thank you again. My name is Jim Richardson. I live in Flint. I vote. Flint votes. Let's all vote. Meet the Candidates, a show where we give residents an opportunity to learn a little bit more about those who want to represent them publicly. I'm your host, Candace Machat. And with me right now is a second ward council candidate, Miss Audrey Young. Hello, how are you? Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks. So, We'll just hop right into this. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, as you know, I was born and raised here, went to high school, went all the way through high school, all the way through college. Actually, from here, um, I graduated from my college. I graduated also from Baker College um, with both my bachelor's and my master's degree from Baker College. Um, I just love it. I mean, I love Flint. Even though I had moved away from here on several occasions, I was back and forth here in Flint because my family was here, my mom in particular. And um, then I decided to move back here at the end of 2012, right prior to the water crisis. And ever since then, I've been, as I say, feet to the, to the street. I've been out and about trying to help people in our community, help people in our neighborhood, help them with different resources. And I've always been known as the resource person. They call me all the time to ask me about where to go and to do different things. So that is just very important to me, um, community service overall. We got to make sure that our people are taken care of. And so that's just me, you know, pretty much that's just me all the way summed up in a nutshell. And I think you've answered my next question a little bit, but I, I would love if you would elaborate on why you decided to run for office. Because I just see a need. I see a need that need to be filled. Um, 
quite often our residents say that they are not getting information that they would like to know. Um, they are they want to know more about what's going on with the city council, but they don't have the the um the patients to sit and wait it out. And they, they just want to have a summary of what goes on. They don't want to hear a lot of the different things that's um, happening in the process it takes to get to, are you voting yes or are you voting no? They want to know the resources of where they can go to get things taken care of. And I think that I've been very good with doing that and a good advocate with trying to make sure those things happen around here, especially, um, I would say in particular in the second ward, but not limited to the second ward. Yeah. All right, and um, just you being a lifelong Flint resident, even though you know you said you pop in, I pop out, but you've been here yes. quite, a, quite a while this time. Um, so, and again, growing up here, tell us who are some of the people who, whether it's past or present, who have who inspire you to keep going and to do the work that you're doing in the city. When I look at people like Mother E. Hill Deloney, um. I've been knowing e, uh, Mother Deloney since I was about six or seven. I've been knowing her since the 70s. When I first met her, it was in relationship to like the 4-H clubs coming out into our community and teaching and helping. She did a lot of great programs. My mom was involved with her with a lot of those programs too. So my mom helped to bring and incorporate me into doing a lot of things in community service type work. Um, we've always been serv servants to the community. You know, you can't be a great leader if you're not ready to serve the people that you are supposed to be entrusting and that's entrusted in your care. So that's one of the things um, um, from E. Hill Deloney and my mother, of course, right there along with her because I saw the things that my mom did. She could bring not something from nothing. I promise you, if you had a little something, she would bring it out and make it be a lot of something. And when I look at how she, um, along with um, some different grant and fundings, she helped with doing the um, helping hands was what it was called. And it was like a mini small Goodwill that was located in the community where we live. And people could come there and buy discount clothing and discount household items. But she was always preparing the items, cleaning them up, fixing them. As they say, used to say mending, we say sewing and repair now. But she used to do that all the time. So those two women in particular are definitely examples to me. When I talk about, um, think about lawyer uh, the lawyer Robinson, when he sat there and, and was instrumental with helping to bring in fair housing to a community who didn't have fair housing. I lived through that era when we, there were certain areas we did not go into as we were growing up, but he looked and set, helped to set up a precedence which brought Flint into notoriety It's history. You know, those are the kind of people that I look for and those are my examples of what keeps me going they did not give up they kept moving mm -hmm. and so we, we all know being a uh, Flintstones about you know the rich history of Flint some of which you just described yeah. right uh, of us being like national model even when it came to schools or uh like, like you said getting rid of housing discrimination sit down strike all that stuff that has happened here in Flint and so one of the things that we've unfortunately become notorious for as of 2015, um, well known, I should say, uh, as of 2015 is the Flint water crisis. And so one of the questions now from 2015 to 2021 is, is the water crisis over? No, it is far from over. It, we still have a long road. Um, many people say, well, what about the, the settlement? Um, what about the infrastructure? We haven't gotten started on the infrastructure getting taken care of here in Flint. I remember promising people from the very beginning, you all do know this is not going to get fixed overnight. Prepare yourself for the long haul. Prepare, prepare yourself for at least eight to 10 years. And I have never stopped saying it eight to 10 years, I've talked to engineers in other cities and they were looking and seeing what it was that was happening with us. They was explaining things to me along the way. They said, you all are gonna be in, the, in this for a while. Just brace yourself and prepare yourself. But many of us did not, um, we, didn't, we didn't believe it. We didn't wanna believe it. They gotta fix this, they gotta fix this immediately. And they have, and it hasn't been fixed. So yeah, it's, it's far from over, far from over. Right. And just thank you for, you know, because we have people that are, are watching this all over the country. And so just thank you for uh, clearing, clarifying that for them. And as it relates to the water settlement, now we know that we are still waiting for 
the judge to, you know, agree to the terms of the settlement, agree to the amount of the settlement. Uh, as it relates to the amount of the settlement, how do, how do you feel that should be divided amongst residents? First of all, I definitely do not believe that 33 and a third of the, the settlement should go to the lawyers. Um, when you start to talk about the disproportionate number, <laughs> and I know that's what the, that, you know, that's the norm. And you're looking at the people who have really suffered the most are getting the least. Because many of those lawyers don't even live in Flint. They don't live anywhere near Flint. They don't even come into Flint to work. So they haven't been subjected to getting poisoned. When I think about myself, they saying I probably won't even get a thousand dollars. And I'm looking at all of the cost of my the infrastructure in my house that have been damaged. And I have a whole house filtration system that I have to change the filters more frequently than a year within a year's time because of the lead coming through the waters from the water plant through the, the, the lines into my home. And I start thinking about the pipes that have been um, damaged already here. I mean, I've replaced a faucet here in my home. This ain't no really cheap faucet. I mean, it's an average cost faucet. I've changed it since the water crisis started two times. I shouldn't have had to change a faucet in my kitchen two times because of the rust, high levels of chlorine in the water, you know, high levels of everything, non-corrosive, but it's corroding the pipes and things that's in here, even with the filtration system. So, I mean, we're, we, you know, we, we're stuck. That's, that's just unfair all the way across the board. And then many of the people were not informed. So like, take for instance, I had to just say, like my daughter had a miscarriage. That's a qualification. My grandchildren was poisoned. That's a qualification. Oh, do they have this? Oh, that's, that's a qualification. Did they have a, a rash? People don't know that they needed to go and keep the documentation that that's a possibility is from the water. You know, it's unfortunate. And then you talk about the effects of lead in the water. How do you expect the average person to be able to comprehend or even to be able to respond effectively to what you're asking them to do when you're saying that the, the lead in the water can poison you? And, and, has, and it causes cognitive deficits. It causes cognitive problems. It does it to the children. We got people around here who have all kinds of issues where they walking on, on crutches and on canes. Mm -hmm. Is it from the water? It's a strong possibility. I mean, we, we could go on and on for days and talking about some of the possibilities that's going on and that the, the, the settlement is definitely not fair to any to, to the people that have suffered and still suffering. Right now, you can if you don't go to one of the water pods and get your water, you can't get it. I got a gentleman that live around the corner from me that's, um he's homebound and he can't even get water unless somebody pick up water and say, here, I'm bringing you some cases of water. He's buying out of his pocket when he go, when he sends somebody to the grocery store for him. That's not fair because it is far from being over and he can't use the faucet water. Nope. You can't use, you shouldn't use those filters on that, on that faucet either, because they're not getting out enough of the impurities from the water. And we already knew that when we got those, those uh, filters that was put on there, they already told us those were not sufficient to take away the lead from the water. And I think you raised a, a very important point there. When you talk about residents who are not able to go to the pods to get water, right? Or those who have to take uh, out-of-pocket expenses for this. Uh, we're looking at the fact that right now um, in the city of Flint, water is back down to at the grocery store, it's only limited, it's back down to being limited to you only being able to get two at a time, right? Uh, because for whatever the reason we're experiencing the um, in-store water shortage, uh, and it, it could be just effects from the, the residuals from uh, the pandemic. But you, you raise a good point there for residents who are not able to, you know, just go to the store and get water. So my, my question to you after that, then, is um, in your in your opinion, you living through this water crisis, you having neighbors and friends and family who are living through this water crisis, um, and you, you alluded to your in-home fixtures and all of that. So what would it take for it to be over? What would over look like um, as far as you're concerned and the residents that you've talked to are concerned? Hmm. I'm gonna take one infrastructure first. Homes need to be re fully repaired. 
the lines from the um not just the lead service lines to the homes but the ones to the street and all the way to the um water uh, plant the water plant refixed and completely completely redone because you cannot continue to put um good water and think that the water coming from that is going to not have some kind of a residual effect you got to do something different about the water that's actually in those in those um water plants i'm just going to tell you there's a lot of pharmaceuticals in the water yep pharmaceuticals that's in the water you get it tested it's more than just lead in the water it's more than just copper in the water that's affecting our bodies ill affecting us so we got to go through and make sure that that plant is really set up correctly that would take care of the water that's coming in. Then we should be able to um, be okay. But right now we got so much psychological damage. I don't even know if the people will ever trust the water coming out the faucet. Many of us travel. When I go out of town, I still don't use the water out the faucet out of town. I go straight and use the water from out of a bottle. I go in and get a case of water wherever I go to, and I'm I'm doing bottled water no matter where. So that's another thing they're not going to get over and they think about that they can just go through and just use the water again out the faucet. Number two, the water, the money that they're going to give to us will never be enough to compensate us. Never, ever be enough because when you start to thinking about it you know when you think about the effects of some of the children and what's happening they got lifelong effects you can't never compensate for that yeah they can get, they can get comfortable but never really fully compensated you talk about the adults who are not any longer here with us who have died waiting to see something different happen waiting to see compensation come up they'll never get that and we can't bring their lives back that can never be compensated for right now. And the, and the prolonging it is doing nothing but add more insult to the injury that has already occurred and happened. We're not getting fairness. Well, I'll put it like this. The people are not feeling fairness from the judicial system. When you go into the court, when you talk to the judge, they're waiting now to see if it was legal, what they're going to do about what when they got the bone scan. Okay, fine. That's holding us up for um, having a, having financial um, gain. I hope they don't wait until close to Christmas time, as they like to do, and throw us some pennies. And we say, well, girl, I'm just happy to get it because now I can go and shop and get Christmas gifts. No, leave that stuff on the shelf. They're going to have to mark it down and you can get it for cheaper after the new year. They That's how they often do when they do class action lawsuits. It's strategically settled. I pray they don't start to settle in it, settling it then. I just know it's going to come close where we're going to spend all our money and give all our money back away. We got to stop doing that economics. We got to start thinking about the economics in our community and save that money, invest that money, and you'll see that money turn over and make something different. I know I'm going off from the water, but that's no. another issue that I got. That's here. We got we got to start to build in our own economic system, our own economic engine here in our own communities. We got to stop allowing everybody else to come into Flint and get rich. They take our money you and go back. You're actually touching on what my next question was, right? So one of the things that the residents talked about as we we um, prepared to do the interviews, one mm -hmm. of the things that the residents talked about was uh, economic development, right? Yes. And so the question that I have for you is specifically for the second board, we know that it needs to be an entire uh, sweep yes. across the city as far as economic development, but specifically for the second board, what is your plan for economic development? Okay, so we got all this grant money that's coming in, right? We got different we got different things. We need to take that grant money and start investing in our future entrepreneurs. We have all of these buildings that's abandoned. Many of them are not in that bad of shape. Why can't we start off by having a program that can teach our young folks how to fix and repair and build and, be, and they can, that when they get in their training, then now they can go out and have their own business. But also the businesses are getting back repaired so that they can open up for people that live in the community or at least live in Flint. We wonder why we don't have that much money and revenue coming in. It's because most of our employers don't employees don't live here in the city. So our tax base is going down. You know, everything goes hand in hand. When you start to getting people gainfully employed, crime rate is going to go back down. It's all going hand in hand. 
We got to sit down at the table and start to get our people who have tried and true with businesses, start up businesses, pop up businesses. Let's get it done. Let's come in and teach those who don't know how to, how to do it, work and mentor them and see them through the process. Let's do a step, uh, 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 maybe a two year step with them because they got to take time to get it themselves up and then get themselves going. I would love to see that and see that being um, taking place. We've had a couple of um, uh, in the past, some uh, different programs where they help with new businesses that want to get started. It won't hurt for us to do that, especially here in the second ward. Just think about it. That's more money, more revenue that will come into the city budget so we won't go into a deficit. We got to start you, doing that. And I think you hit on something really important there when you talked about public safety, right? Yeah. Um, so as far as public safety and black specifically for the second ward, uh, what is your plan to move forward? What's my plan to move oh. forward with helping with fight crime a little bit? Is that what you're like? With, the, public, with, safety public, safety? And, with public safety and blight, yes. Yeah, public safety and blight. One of the things, too, back to the grant money that we got, we got that $47 million that's sitting down there. I would love to see more of that go to helping us with um, fighting blight. When we talk about fighting blight, you got to fight it from all ends. Every one of us as a resident of Flint, we have a responsibility to report blight. If you're afraid to say something to them, if you see somebody throwing something out their car, say, hey, hey, don't pick them, you know, pick it up. Let's go to the old way that our moms and grandmoms used to do it. Uh-uh, you can't leave that here. And then if, you, if you're afraid to do that, write the license plate number down, call them in. We're going to have to stop it that in that manner. Yes, we have a responsibility to keep our communities cleaned up and keep our communities together, but we do not have the responsibility to do the job that the city and the county is already paid to get done. We do not have that as a responsibility. That's on them. They need to start coming out and making sure they're doing it. We don't mind helping you, but you got to come out and make sure that that's getting done. And then with the safe community safety, we just got through doing some different things on my block. I ended up, you know, we ended up, our neighborhood association, Kirkwood Lane Neighborhood Association, just got a chance to get $1,500 from that safety grant money that they had. We took the classes and we just got through buying lights, um, solar lights for the homes to uh, light up the backyards. Some of the um, doorbells, I, we always call them, everybody call them ring, but all of them are not rings, but they're similar to rings. We bought that for several other houses. So now that we have those on there, we can uh, um, increase the camera surveillance of our street, but not only just that, now we can feel safer in our home because we can see what the activity that's going on around our home. So those are different ways. We got also, we got our stores and places where people are loitering. We need to work with a partnership with that store, the store owners and say, hey, look, this is causing a problem in our community, especially mm -hmm. when the store owner do not live in the city nor in the neighborhood where their store is located. Half the times they're not even there. They got somebody else that's working the store for them. We need to work up with a partnership with them. Like, hey, look, we know that you got the Lord. And are you feeling safe? First, we need to make sure they're feeling safe. And then we need to take the next step and say, we want to feel safe like you feel safe. Mm -hmm. We live here. We're here with them 24 hours a day. We want to feel safe like you like you feel safe. We got to we got to do something about that, and then of course that last step is working with law enforcement to enforce that. And you talk a lot about like working with others and collaboration and partnerships. One of the things that we know is um, that once you're on the city council, you have to work with the current administration to get a lot of these things done that you want to get done in your ward, not only just your ward but just all over the city. And so I just want to know what what is your take on the current relationship between the counts of the the current administration and the current council and do you think it needs to change and if so what are you committed to do to help lead that change yes it needs to change it's gotta change where can we start <laughs> where can we start with that first of all sitting down and just trying to find out because if they I believe really I truly believe that if they sat at the table with one another and really just had you know a heart to heart talk with one another that they would find out that they got a lot of common goals and then they find a way to work on the common goals we know that um a lot of the things that um 
that that separate them. They got a lot of differences, but they got to figure out what is it they can do to settle those differences. You can't settle a difference if you don't know what it is. Somebody got to take ownership for the difference that's that's currently there. Um, they, you know, we know that there was money that was available. Then now we know that the money is gone. <laughs> we know that there's there. I mean, we're now going to be in a hole as a city. We're going to have a deficit at the end of the at the end of the budget year. What can we do and what can we cut back on that can help us save some of the money? I mean, like you talk about police. Well, they haven't hired a lot of police and they got money that's there available for the police. If you got income available for 10 police officers and each one of those police officers, their annual salary, I'm just guessing it, 40000 a year. That's $400,000 that you got that should be back in the pot that you haven't spent. So that money didn't go anywhere. Where is it going to be used? That money is still there. You have it already in your budget, but you haven't spent it. Now, you know, like we all know, if you in a household and you got a budget that say only thing you need to spend this month on bills, I'm just going to throw out a number just for, for, for the sake of it, $1,000. But yet still, you know that you got $1,200 available. You know you done saved $200 because you didn't spend it, even though you say hey, I got that $200 just in case. Now that can go into your savings. So where's that, that that money from those police officers that didn't get hired? What happened to that money? I want to know. Um, not only just not only just that, um, we got to we gotta just talk. You know what I mean? Come on, we all here in the city of Flint together. I take it that we all live here inside the city of Flint. We got to sit down and try to figure out what we can do. And um, maybe they might have to have a mediator. You know, a fair, non-biased mediator. Sometimes it takes now, that. Now, Miss Audrey, you said a lot, and you're talking about having a mediator and having somebody sit down and talk to them. So based off of the last television show that you watched, right, the last television show that you watched, uh, that, that that person would be the mediator over council. So who would be mediating between council and the administration based off of the last television show that you watched? Hey, look at you. You want to know what I watch on TV. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? Honestly, when I turned off the TV this morning, because I haven't had it back off since this morning, I was watching um, the CBS Morning News. So okay. it, would to be, it would have to be one of the, um, it might be It might be Gail, because I think it was Gail that I was watching that was on there. So she could come in and mediate. She might be good with, me, with mediating. That would there be fun. Go. There you go. She might be a blast. It's good to have a calming presence in the room to say, hey, let's work this out for the residents. Yes. So, uh, Ms. Audrey, it has been a, an extreme pleasure uh, yeah. interviewing you today. I yeah. want you to do me a favor, look in the camera and tell the residents of the second board why they should vote for you. They should vote for me because I'm long standing. I ain't going nowhere and I'm going to be here. I'm going to see you through. You could call me. I answer my phone. You can, you can knock on my door and I'm going to help you find the solution to whatever your problem is. We're going to work together and I'm going to be honest with you. We're going to definitely work together. I'm going to be transparent. You don't have to worry about me. I will be as transparent as it comes. I, Like I said, I will lead you to where you need to go to get the answers that you need, and I won't stop until you get it. And we're going to work it out together. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right, there you have it. Uh, this it has been again. It has been a pleasure interviewing you, and I just want to thank you. We this was uh Miss Audrey Young, candidate for second ward council seat. Hello, I'm Alfred. L. Harris Sr. of the Saints of God Church in Flint, Michigan and president of the Concerning Pastors for Social Action here in Flint and I want you to know I vote. Capture your future at Mott Community College. Hello, and welcome to Meet the Candidates. 
a show where we give residents the opportunity to learn to learn a little bit more about the candidates who hope day represent them. I'm your host, Candace Mashat, and with me today is a second ward council candidate, Miss Liddell Lewis. Good evening, Miss Lewis. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much. Oh, awesome, awesome. I am so happy that you could join me this evening. Um, so let's get right into it. For residents who may not be familiar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I am born and raised um, here in the second ward. So when they say Merle Hood, that has a, a place near and dear to my heart. Went to Merrill Elementary School, Longfellow, and um, I am a Northern Viking. And I'm also a graduate of the University of Michigan Flint, where I am a Wade H. McCree scholar. And then I went on to complete my graduate degrees, my uh, master's and PhD from Western Michigan University. So I, yeah, I have a lot of, wow, I am very, very, very community uh, minded, community driven. And I, I never paid attention to it until someone brought it to my attention. Like you've been out here for a long time. And I have. I've received several awards, even when Dane Walling started the Flint Club. Yeah, I was awarded um, many Flint Awards. Uh, I was one of the first cohorts. No, I was the first cohort to graduate from the University of Michigan with service learning cohorts. Mm -hmm. So I I've been out here working tirelessly for our community for a long time. And so now is just the perfect timing for me to bring that to the second ward. So I guess it's like a welcome home. All right, so Dr. Liddell Lewis, tell us, I think you gave us a little bit of it, but tell us a little bit more about what made you decide to run for office. Well, you know, when uh, I, I was living in D.C. for um, a, a hot minute, people don't even know because I was still in Flint so much that you would never know. But, um, but yeah, so living there and my father, he took ill. So I immediately came home to take care of my daddy. And when I came home to attend to my father, I noticed that not only was he sick, but my community was sick. This was not the same community that I was used to. I didn't grow up in, in, in this specific space. So I said, let me go ahead and get some boots on the ground and change some things. So that's when I started the Cyrus Park Neighborhood Association. So we began to do great things, write grants, get things done, establish more neighborhood cohesiveness. I became a park adopter, start bringing more events to the park because I wanted people to have pride and feel good about where they stay. You shouldn't go home talking about how bad you want to leave. You should definitely have pride in where you stay because that's how it was when I was coming up. We took pride in our neighborhood. So I began to do that. So just long story short, um, I wanted to see if the rest of the second ward would like me to transfer these efforts that I took here in Cyrus Park to the rest of the ward. And here I am. Okay. And and you you mentioned growing up in Flint and how it's a lot different from what you remember. But uh, one thing is for sure about Flint is that we have a rich history of activism and a rich history of nationwide leadership. So I, I'm just wondering, might be some of the people who have inspired you or who still inspire you to this day, either past or present? From Flint? From Flint. Oh, man. Let me tell you, we had some great people come through here and, and touch my life. I, I can start with Otis Spann, the late Otis Spann. Then I can go to David Munnerlin and Prentice Munnerlin over there at Merrill Elementary School. Then I can also just um, fast forward a little bit. So this isn't ne neglecting anyone, but just fast forwarding to the late Danielle Brown, who was boots mm -hmm. on the ground, very active. So uh, a lot of people have inspired me, you know, along my journey. I take a little bit from everyone. But, yeah, I'll be all day doing the roll call because Flint produces some great people, some great people. Right. And trust me, I understand. It's one of those questions where you kind of hate to um, have people start saying names because it's like, well, we could be here forever. And two, you might forget somebody. It's like charge it to my heart. I mean, to my head and not my heart. Trust me. You As inspired me, you too. Yeah. Yeah, hey, listen, it, it sounds like some it sounds like you answered that question before. <laughs> so I will repeat right. that. Charge it to my head and definitely not my heart. I call it young timer. Right. Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> but I do want to point out that you did say something very important. Again, going back to the remark where you said that Flint is very different from how a lot of people might remember it. And while 
um, it's not quite what the nation thinks or knows about us, like because Flint is really a great place, right? But as with any great place, you can always make it better, make some improvements. So what are some of the things that you see lacking in Flint? Uh, I will say, hmm, outside of hope, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely lacking. Like I was saying, um, people that they're not having pride in, 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 in where they are. Mm -hmm. So, and when you don't have pride, you begin to have, you know, people begin to become apathetic, you know, they just start mm -hmm. going through the motions. And so, you know, that's a major thing for me. So, cause you know, we used to say it with, with, with pride represent our neighborhood, but now not so much people, um, I represent the neighborhood in terms of can't wait to get out and move to another suburban area of Flint. So, you know, so, so that key thing is lacking in addition to, um, you know, a lot of economic development over here um, on the North side, because I remember when Cloud Road was the place to be, I'm talking right. about Pizza Hut, Baskin Robin. Okay. So uh, hopefully I'm not revealing uh, that I like to eat, but you know, all those great places and spaces on Cloud Road, it used to be, the place where you can go and get anything. It, it, it mm -hmm. was like the quote unquote Miller road of the North side. And now we don't have that. It's like a ghost town, you know, and we barely have um, like, I say barely, I don't want to um, over exaggerate, but you know, um, street lights going out, boarded up mm -hmm. um, buildings. So yeah. So, so those things um, are different and those things are missing um, specifically over here. And just side note, when I was looking for a place to have my candidate watch party, I had a hard time because the second ward doesn't have any many options. We didn't have a restaurant that I, I could uh, go to and watch this, you know, on um, community, uh, like a rental hall. We were short. So we are definitely lacking things that, you know, that other places take for granted. And so it sounds like um, a, a lot of economic development is needed specifically in the second ward. And so I'm just wondering, what is your plan specifically for the second ward? We know that uh, it, it's a, a, an all Flint thing, right? Where economic development is needed. But specifically in the second ward, what is your plan for economic development? Well, I can't say I have a extra big plan specifically, but again, my goal is to bring people and things back to the North side. So I'll give you a primary example. So on this Saturday, from three to five, from seven to nine. We are transforming Forest Park, and what a lot of people know it as, but it's currently named, renamed, Max Brandon Park. We, we are transforming that into a Halloween haven. And so our goal is to make this park that we abandoned here for decades, you know, that has a bad history, a bad uh, reputation. No, we are cleaning it up and we are having events here. And so our goal is to make Forest Park become the Halloween hotspot, not just for the North Side, not just for uh, of the city of Flint or even the state of um, Genesee County, but we're talking about the state of Michigan. So we're putting together a candy hunt where we're dropping over 6,000 eggs, candy filled eggs, um, and they're filled with candy, money, gift certificates, a whole variety of things, over a mile and a half. So we're getting the people to the park. We're getting people to um, out moving with their family, you know, getting in their steps. And yeah, so we're doing those great things. And then, you know, we're converting it to a haunted trail from seven to nine. Usually you would have to go to Birch Run, Swartz Creek. You have to go way outside of Flint to pay them 20 to $40 just for that experience. But what we're doing, we're bringing that right here to the north side. And it's going to be free this year. It's going to be free. So that is one way how we're bringing people into the city with activities that you can't find um, anywhere else. And we're going to make it so good because I have a high standard of excellence that we're going to make a name for ourselves. People are going to come back. And then maybe we can raise funds from charging for, the, for these things. But like I said, that's what I want to do. I want to take these jewels that we have right here on the north side. And I want to bring people all over the state to them. And this Halloween experience this Saturday is going to be one, one example of that. Right. And it sounds like just in you talking about uh, 
Max Brandon Park or Forest Park, you know, just depending on what era you are in Flint. But as you're talking about that, one of the concerns for that park uh, a, a long time ago, but it's not necessarily a concern now, is uh, public safety, right? And so in the second mm -hmm. ward, uh, public safety is a concern to residents. H how do you plan to address public safety in the second ward? Uh, well, that is definitely a great question. So uh, one of my things that I, that was the primary focus of me starting the Cyber Park Neighborhood Association was the fact that I established a working relationship with local law enforcement. So we have a great working relationship and, and you know, we are working with the residents to, to build, um, um, to, to build, because when I say build, first you gotta have trust on the people that you call to protect you. So we've done uh, different things with neighbors changing Flint. So we put together a community policing presentation and yeah, and we're just working hand in tandem doing things like that. Um, first building the trust because a lot of people there hear gunshots, they won't even call the police. <laughs> So we're definitely working hand in hand. And not just that, you know, if I hear a good idea, I'm willing to bring it to the table. You know, um, we're, we're open to all new, new ideas. But yeah, like I said, working hand in hand with local law enforcement. Um, it was this year I spearheaded the National Night Out. You know, that's the day when local law enforcement across the country, when they get together and they do something great within the neighborhoods. So um, I piloted that and we went to all nine wars and we did um, a citywide ice cream social. So giving out ice creams to all of the residents. So yeah, and, and it, it was led by the police. So letting people know that, you know, um, and establishing great relationships with law enforcement, holding them accountable at the same time, you know, because you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because like I tell people, when something goes wrong, the police going to be one of the top three you call. The first one might be your mama. The second one might be your friend. But the third one, you going to call the police. So we got to make sure that we have a great working relationship with them. Hopefully that answers right. that question. Absolutely. And I think, speaking of working relationships, uh, the current council and the current administration, which it's, it's and it's not anything... Uh, new here in the city of Flint, but the current council and the, the current administration, um, how do you feel about their relationship and how they work together? Is it something that you think needs to change? And if so, how are you committed to being that change? Well, you know, I always say you start at home. So how am I committed? I'm committed not to, well, you know, the relationship is there's no relationship. Let's go ahead and keep it 100. They have no working relationship. It's a lot of back and forth. Um, it's very toxic. And we see that, understandable. But how I'm going to fix it, I'm going to fix it by taking care of me first. So by not, quote unquote, indulging, by not participating, you know, because this is this isn't personal at all. And it should never get personal. It's all about working for the betterment of, of the residents of the city of Flint. You know, so if it's not city business, if it's not moving the city forward, we should not be discussing it. We should not, it should not be a factor. So that's my contribution. I'm not going to con contribute to, you know, to toxic environments. And so people can't argue with yourself. I mean, well, there you have it. It's really that simple. Um, one of the things that has been happening uh, nationwide, right? Uh, well, not nationwide. One of the things that has been known globally, uh, as far as the city of Flint is concerned, is that in 2015, it became uh, world knowledge that the city of Flint was um, in a water crisis. And here we are, 2021. And one of the things that we're asked all the time, no matter where you go, is, is the water crisis over? And so I have to ask you today, is the water crisis over? Well, you know, perception is reality. So as of right now, people perceive no, so the answer is no. You know, when we receive letters to our home stating that the city of Flint didn't meet their um, designated number for water samples, the answer is no. The fact that we're still testing like that means the answer is no. So uh, then everyone having to have their, their pipes replaced, the answer is no. All right, and... um. As far as you're concerned, as a resident of Flint, as uh, someone hoping to represent uh, other residents of Flint, and someone that is very community focused, community minded, and, and you, when you talk to residents, what do you feel over will look like? Oh, over for the water crisis? 
Mm-hmm. When, because I didn't want to make sure. So you mean over for the water crisis, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, over will mean that we no longer have to, um, everyone's pipes will be replaced. And then we won't have to um, co- continuously um, receive water updates through the mail. And, but, re- but in real reality, it may be decades before the citizens, you know, really trust using their water for anything. A lot of us have filters, you know, on our, on our faucets, but we still mm-hmm. use bottled water. We don't even use that filter for real. We, we, we wash our dishes and filter water. <laughs> A lot of people don't use that water. I mean, but so I, I really can't say, you know, I say perception is reality. And so many people, they have been scarred. They have felt wrong. And the fact that we were even in a water crisis that people denied for for such a long time. I mean, people, it, it may never be over, you know, until this generation passes away. It, mm. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, one of the things that's going on right now, uh, residents are waiting for the judge to accept the settlement uh, that has been offered. And you know that that is big talk here in Flint. And one of the things, you know, whether you stand on the side of you think the settlement is enough or you do not think the settlement is enough, uh, we know the amount that is proposed. Um, we know what's been going on lately with that amount and how it has decreased. But uh, how do you feel that amount should be divided amongst the residents? How do I feel that it should be divided? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I, I never sat down to think about how it should be divided. But um, but I know that everyone, everyone w- was affected equally. Everyone was affected equally. Now, different people had, you got to excuse me, I'm getting my charter. It happens that quick. So, yeah, so, you know, everyone, they, their bodies may have reacted differently, but everyone, we had equal I- exposure. You know, my father, he was battling COPD during the time. So, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, and then he was in the hospital for like double pneumonia and stuff, and he didn't get tested for Legionnaires. But, you know, so it affected him differently. But yet, you know, we all were exposed. So I feel that all that needs to be taken into consideration. You know, one thing I try not to do, I try not to speak uh, specifically like I'm an expert on everything. But yeah, but to, that's how I can answer that question. That's the best that I can answer that question. We all have been exposed equally, but our bodies react differently. So um, we need to be compensated based on that. Okay. And one of the things that we know that the the water crisis happened as a result of uh, just failure on all levels of government, right? And so as residents uh, have lived this reality since 2015, like you said, you notice that a lot of residents are apathetic now. Uh, And sometimes if it is not a presidential election year, they will not turn out to vote. So what are you doing to make sure that residents are turning out to vote uh, in your council race? Well, um, I guess outside of, of going um, door to door, dropping off literature, you know, because um, I've been dropping off literature, um, speaking about, you know, knowing your rights. So I've been going door to door, making sure that um, that I leave literature on everyone's doorstep and um, and just, and just in- encouraging people, let them know how important voting is. And not just in a cliche way, I try to get specific, like, you know, what um, politics affect everything. A lot of people say, well, I, I don't want to get involved in politics. No, I'm not political. Well, just to let you know, politics affect everything that we do, even the water that we breathe. Sometimes not the water we breathe, even the water that we drink and the air that we breathe. Say hello, Jackson. Hello. Okay. Hi, Jackson. All, want <laughs> <laughs> all right, bye now. Thank you. Thank you much. All right, yeah. So, so really honing that point in, like, yeah, you're not political, but do you drink water? Politics poison flint so for mm-hmm. you to say that you're disengaging or not engaging you you're selling them again hey poison us again you can do whatever you want to to me and my family so i try to bring it home and make it real to people so that it's just bigger than just going and bubbling you know saying the yeah the ballot yeah this is right. your life at, on the line right. now Don't i think we just had an opportunity to meet jackson there is jackson knocking doors with you as well uh, well, it's so funny. He's at school. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Okay. He's at school. Um, yeah, spreading the good word. So, <laughs> I, I went, yeah. Listen, I went to a parent-teacher 
conference and the teacher told me that that he's so proud of, of everything that we do at Cyrus Park. I said, hi. And they're like, yeah, he come home and he said, my mommy is the queen of Cyrus Park. <laughs> so you can't beat that. Yeah. So when, when the kids see the passion, it must be real. Right. You cannot. And aside from Jackson, based off of the last television show that you watched, and you had to go out there knocking doors. Who would be knocking doors with you? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so you you asking me um who would be knocking doors with me? You talking about famous or based off of the like, last the television? Street? Based off of the last television show that you watched, who would be knocking doors with you? Matlock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who? Let let me tell you. Yeah, if, if if you millennial, you might not know, but yeah, Candace, you know who Matlock is. So my mother used to watch Madlock all the time. So yes, I had to watch Madlock. So yes. Very and I'm going to tell you right well. now, you have a pretty good chance of uh, persuading people to vote for you if you have Ben Madlock uh, knocking doors for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, what's that song say? You got to have some real ones on your team. Right. You know, that, uh, there you go. <laughs> And so I, I just want to thank you. But before we get out of here, Dr. Lewis, please do me a favor and look in the camera and let the second ward residents know why they should vote for you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Candace. So I feel you should vote for me because you want change, because you you are invested in taking back our neighborhood because this is our community. We are vested mm -hmm. here. A lot of us, we are homeowners. And even if you're not a homeowner, you live here. And you matter, your family matter. And so it's time for us to take it to the next level. And I'm here for that. I'm here for you. So if you want that change, feel free to vote for me. But if that's not what you're looking for, that's definitely all right, too. But in any event, I'm going to continue to do my part to push not only the second ward forward, but just the city of Flint as a whole. And if you don't believe me, Google me. <laughs> well, Dr. Liddell Lewis, it has been my pleasure interviewing you. And I, I just want to uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I, I want to remind Absolutely. the residents, um, get out there. November is coming. So learn more about the candidates. Watch the show so that you can find out about who's running in your ward. ward. And once again, thank you to Dr. Liddell Lewis, who is running for second ward council candidate.